Matur evacha Matu Patur Vabalina Kretur Agne Shunopiva Dehakim Anna Datu Swam Nishketur Matur evacha Matu Pitur Va Balena Kretur Agni Shuno Piva Dehakim Anadatu Swam Nishketur Matur Evacha Matu Pitur Va Balena Kretur Agni Shuno Piva Deha This body Kim Anadatu Does it belong to the employer who gives me the money to maintain it? Swam or does it belong to me personally? Nishektu. Or does it belong to the person who discharged the semen? Matu Eva. Or does it belong to the mother who maintained this body within her womb? Cha and Matu Pituva or does it belong to the father of the mother because sometimes the father of the mother takes a grandson as an adopted son. Balena or does it belong to the person who takes, who takes this body away by force? Kretu, or to the person who purchases the body as a slave? Agne, or to the fire? because ultimately the body is burned. Shuna, or to the dogs and vultures that ultimately eat it. Api, even, va, or. Translation. While alive, does this body belong to the employer, to the self, to the father, the mother, or the mother's father? Does it belong to the person who takes it away by force, to the slave master who purchases it, or to the sons who burn it in the fire? Or if the body is not burned, does it belong to the dogs that eat it? Among the many possible elements, who is the rightful claimant? Not to ascertain this, but instead to maintain the body by sinful activities is not good. No purport. We'll read text number 12. Evam sadaranam deham avyakta Prabhava Pyayam Covid Vam Atmasat Kritva Hanti Jantum Nasata Translation This body, after all, is produced by the manifested nature and again annihilated and merged 
in the natural elements. Therefore, it is the common property of everyone. Under the circumstances, who but a rascal claims this property as his own, and while maintaining it, commits such sinful activities as killing animals just to satisfy his whims. Unless one is a rascal, one cannot commit such sinful activities. Purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, Srila Prabhupada. Atheists do not believe in the existence of the soul. Nonetheless, unless one is very cruel, why should one kill animals unnecessarily? The body is a manifestation of a combination of matter. In the beginning, it was nothing. But by a combination of matter, it has come into existence. Then again, when the combination is dismantled, the body will no longer exist. In the beginning, it was nothing, and in the end, it will be nothing. Why then should one commit sinful activities when it is manifested? It is not possible for anyone to do this unless he is rascal number one. Om Magyana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksur Unmilitanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Vanchakaupa Tarubhyasya Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavan Ebyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasade Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare We're hearing Narada Muni philosophize about the thinking behind the activities of the two sons of Kuvera, the two sinful sons of Kuvera named Mani Griva and Nala Kuvera. So Narada Muni begins he, we heard, first of all, uh, he began by saying uh, the problem was their wealth. They had so much wealth. And because of their wealth, they were performing activities without trying to control their senses. And the most voracious of all the senses is the tongue. And because of their uncontrolled tongues, they will eat all kinds of things like animals, animal flesh. And they're fond of wine and women and gambling. So like this, they use their wealth for these kinds of activities. So then Narada Muni went on to describe about the body, how ultimately everyone's body is going to die and with the death of the body then the body is disposed by different ways sometimes it's fed to birds just like there's one religion called Parsi these people Parsis they came from Iran came to India there's a community of them in, in, in India they worship the sun god. They worship fire. So they say fire is pure and they don't want to put the dead body into fire. So they don't burn the body 
instead they feed the body, they leave the dead body for birds like vultures to come and eat. So you see where there's a community of Parsis, you regularly see there's usually some vultures around who come and eat the dead bodies for them. So the birds eat the dead body, so the, the body becomes a food for the bird, and then the birds also pass stool. So ultimately that body becomes the stool of the bird. In other places we burn the body and it becomes ashes. Of course Muslim and Christian they don't burn the body, generally they will bury the body. And when they bury the body, then it becomes worms. Because different creatures eat the flesh of the body. Sometimes the worms are in the body, other worms come from the earth. One way or another, the body is eaten by the worms. So in this way, the body is transformed into ashes or stew, unpleasant things. Now, we heard today Narada Muni was describing how this body, he's, quest he's questioning who is the proprietor of this body? Who does it belong to? Somebody may say it the father says, my son, because the father used his semen to produce a child. So the father said, he's my child, I produced him. But the mother also says, he's my child, because the father discharges the semen into the wife, and the wife holds the child, conceives the child within her womb and gives the child shelter in her womb for ten months before birth, and then raises the child after birth. So in this way, the father saying, my child, the mother saying, my child, but then sometimes also, the child is taken by some other family members. Just like sometimes, the, the wife may already have several children and she doesn't want another children. But she has a sister who is married and doesn't have a child. So she may say to her sister, you take this child. And in this way the child is given away to someone else. Or it may be the, the father and mother, the grandparents, when they when the child is born, the grandparents want to have the child as their child. They bring it up. I met one couple, both the husband, who was the son of the couple, the son died and the wife also died. Sometimes car crash or sometimes maybe some other problem like drugs or something, but anyway both the parents died and the, grand, the, the grandparents raised the child just like their own child. So they say our child, but of course it's their grandchild. And then also you get the situation where the body is sold as a slave. Just like in the past there was slavery. People would be brought, brought sometimes it, it was uh, in, from Africa, they would bring pe African people over to America to pick the cotton. So they were slaves. And here also, sometimes in India, in the past, may have that custom that people could be sold as a slave to another family. And so then the man thinks, He's my slave, he's my property. So who does the body actually belong to? Ultimately, the body is going to 
be finished in course of time. So it transforms into these different elements. Somebody's thinking, my, this body, the man himself, he's thinking, it's my body, belongs to me. But then we find ourselves in this situation, we have no independence. The parents claim, you're, you're our child, you do what we say. And then the, you may be sold as a slave and the custodian, custodian of the slave, you're, uh, you're my property, you do what I say. So who does the body actually belong to? It's interesting question. So Narada Muni is examining this kind of thinking. Yeah. So who is the, who actually does the body belong to? Not to not to ascertain this, but instead to maintain the body by sinful activities is not good. So Nar Narada Muni is saying if you maintain this body just by doing sinful activities, then this is, ve this is not good, this is very bad. So sinful acts, sinful activity, we have to know what is sin. Of course there's different standards of sin in every society. We, in, in the Vedic society, we consider sinful activities to be acts of irreligion, uh, for example, immorality or uh, killing animals, we consider it to be sinful. But there are other traditions, other beliefs, just like generally Christian society, they're all meat eaters and in the Muslim also, also meat eating. Prabhupada describes them as uh, meat-eating religions. It's their culture. They think it's their culture to eat. So s they're engaged in different activities. They can say to maintain the body. But who does the body actually belong to? The body is made up of material elements. Where do these material elements come from? And where do they go to? In the Bhagavad Gita, we learn, Krishna says, Aham sarvasya prabhavo mata sarvam pravartate itim madva bhajanti mam buddha bhava samamvita Krishna says, I am the source of everything material and spiritual. The wise who know this will worship me with love. So everything ultimately has its origin from the Supreme Lord. It's not that we are the creator of anything. We are also created. So who is the original creator? That should be understood. My body has a source, we could say, comes from my parents. But my parents, they also have a source from their parents. And their parents also have a source in their parents. And in this way we go back and we should come back to the original person, the original personality in this world. Ultimately, we sh everything comes from God. Sarva karana karanam, the cause of all causes. However, we get many different kinds of people in the world today. Uh, Narada Muni went on to say, this body, after all, is produced by the unmanifested nature and again annihilated and merged in the material elements. Right? Everything comes from the Mahatattva. Mahatattva, the sum total of the material energy, and from the Mahatattva, the different elements are created. You get the different kinds of prakriti. As Krishna describes the prakriti in the Bhagavad Gita. We have the inferior prakriti and the superior prakriti. 
inferior prakriti means the mahabhotis, the different elements, earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence and false ego. That's the inferior prakriti because no consciousness. So these are the different elements of the material creation which are used give, to give bodies to the superior prakriti. Superior prakriti being the living entities described in Bhagavad Gita also. Aparyamitas tvanyam prakritim vidime param jiva bhuta mahabaho yeidam daryate jagat. Right? Krishna is saying, besides this material nature, there is the superior energy of mind, which are all living entities who are trying to claim some kind of proprietorship over this material world. So this, we living entities are the superior prakriti. We are also the energy of the Lord. But we are superior because we have consciousness. But when we take our birth in this world, we have this, this mood, the yayidam daryate jagat, that this world is there for our enjoyment, for us to in, uh, exploit it for our pleasures. But we get a lot of problems with that. Krishna also describes in Bhagavad Gita Mami Vamsa Jiva Loke, Jiva Buddha Sanatana, Manashastani Indriyani, Prakriti Stani Karshati. Prakriti Stani Karshati. The living entities are my eternal fragmental parts and parcels. Due to conditioned life, they are struggling very hard with the material nature. Prakriti Stani Karshati. We are struggling with the material nature. Why are we struggling? Because Yeyi Dam Darya Chagat. We are trying to exploit it. We are thinking it is for our enjoyment. We don't understand our actual position. So this creates the problems. Narada Muni explains the body comes from the material elements and it goes back to the material elements. Therefore, it is the common property of everyone. Someone, not everyone believes in God. We know, but it's a very atheistic society. We have whole nations where people are indoctrinated into atheism. Even in the Western world today, people, there, there's atheist societies. Uh, some of the devotees were telling me they're studying in a big university in Australia and they have a program, they have their Krishna club meeting. But after the Krishna club meeting comes the atheist society. And the atheist society comes in and they look at the devotees chanting and they see their activities and they ridicule them. They try to mock them and ridicule them because they're atheists. They think it's foolish to believe in any god. So there are many atheists in the world. And so Nar Narada Muni describes like this that uh, the, these, some, pe some people may say oh, there is the, the common that this body is the common property of everyone. If you just take it logically like that, because nobody, people haven't seen God, so they don't believe in God, so they say, why you should believe in someone you haven't seen, you don't know he's actually there, you can't prove he's, uh, there's really a God there, they argue like this. So they say this body belongs to everyone belongs to everyone. How can it belong to everyone? Just like if you say, I am everyone's servant. If someone says, I am everyone's servant, then they're a rascal. How can you serve everyone? It's impossible. You can serve one person or a few people. You can't serve everyone. That is just nonsense talk. So to say this is the property of everyone, this, an, this is also, this is another stupid statement. It's not logical. 
under the circumstances, who but a rascal claims this property as his own, and while maintaining it, commits such sinful activities as killing animals, just to satisfy his whims. So, this is the situation, just to satisfy their whims. Actually, they have no good reason for killing the animals. People say, oh, I want to eat. There's so many other things to eat. They don't have to kill the animals. They don't have to use violence to eat. Everything is available there in the farm of food grains and vegetables and fruits. But people are so sinful, they're so hard-hearted, they're so cruel that they like to give pain and suffering to innocent animals. Just like sometimes in the market you will see they will have chickens. And if you go, if you're in countries like China or India, sometimes you go there, people will purchase the chicken or the hen. It's alive when they purchase it. It's alive, but the man will chop the head off. It's, so when the little child may be there, and the child sees it, the child will cry. The child can understand the cruelty involved, but the, the, the person is so cruel and so hard-hearted that they, cannot, they don't think they're doing anything wrong. And they will just laugh at the child crying. So this is the situation. Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada it said there was a pastime. He saw some people with fish and they were carrying fish with them. And Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati saw it and he lamented. He thought, so cruel, so hard-hearted that they want to kill the fish, eat. So this is the demonic mentality. Just as there, there are go godly people, there are also demonic people. The demonic nature is described in the Bhagavad Gita. Ishwaraham ahambogi siddhoham balavam suki. The demon is thinking, I am the controller. I, I, everything is happening by my arrangement. Ishwaraham Ahambogi, I am the enjoyer. They're thinking this whole world is just here for me to enjoy. They don't think about anybody else. They're so selfish and hard-hearted. They're thinking everything is for their own pleasure. They're thinking I am powerful, I am strong, and I am happy. But of course, this is very temporary and very soon their world will be destroyed because they have a material body. They have to suffer the different miseries of life, old age, disease and death. They take the material body, they have to die. And they've given a lot of pain and suffering to others in their life. When they die, they will also experience a lot of pain and suffering. And after death, they will also have to suffer more. So the suffering is not finished with death, but it continues. So Narada Muni is thinking about all of these different things. Uh, he says, unless one is a rascal, one cannot commit such sinful activities. So rascals, so many rascals in the world today. They do not want to control their senses. They have no feeling of responsibility to others. They don't have any caring, mood of caring or giving protection to others. This is very much regrettable. When Srila Prabhupada went to Australia, on one occasion, the devotees arranged for him to go to the 
monastery of some Franciscan monks. They were followers of St. Francis. And uh, they gave a very nice reception to Prabhupada and they made a very nice big plate of fruit for Prabhupada. And Prabhupada enjoyed them, talking to them. And the monks told Prabhupada, they said, you know, St. Francis, he used to speak to the, the plants and the trees and he would say, my dear sister flower, my dear brother tree. He would see God in all the different forms of life. When Srila Prabhupada heard this, Srila Prabhupada said to the monks, he said, oh, he said, that is real God consciousness. God consciousness, to see life in all living entities. It's very important to develop that kind of appreciation for life. Unfortunately, people are so blind today. The, the, the demonic mentality is so strong that they can eat anything without thinking about it. They have no feeling. And you can see also how some of these commercial chains, these big restaurant chains, they're very successful in blinding the people by, they make a, a very attractive presentation with their restaurants and dining rooms that come and enjoy and then they'll, they'll make a, also a, a park for the children with some swings and games. Come and your children will be happy here and you will enjoy and in this way they sit and they eat all kinds of forbidden prohibited food. They don't show them the nasty scenes which go on behind producing the food the slaughtering, the butchering, how they are cruelly treating the animals in the most horrible ways. So, foolish people today are like that. They, they, they don't think about it. They don't think what you're supposed to eat, what you're not. They don't even understand that things like milk come from the cow. People think milk is something like, you know, it's like one of these soft drinks, carbonated drinks. You get it from the factory. So they think milk is something like that. They don't understand that milk actually comes from the cow. So they have said people have this very materialistic vision behind everything. They're thinking everything is done by science. As Prabhupada used to say, the scientists cannot produce one grain of food, cannot produce one grain of rice. Everything is provided by God. But we are thinking we are the doer. We do not understand how actually everything is given to us by the grace of God. And similarly, the life of all of these different living entities is given by the grace of God. And when we interfere with their life, then this is sinful. To take the life of other living entities is a great sin. And people have to suffer for that. Just like our own bodies, we all want to live. We have the desire to live. You can see with this coronavirus, people are worried. Why are they worried? They're the fear of death. Because people have that fear. We're afraid of death. We want to live. And just as we want to live, other living entities also desire to live. The different creatures who are so cruelly treated when the animals are taken to the slaughterhouse. It's a very pathetic and horrible scene. But people are blind to these things. So, 
it's important for people to understand not just the body but the soul that within the body there is the eternal soul and that soul is a part of the Supreme Lord and every living entity is a part of God. We want to therefore give proper respect for all different forms of life. Prabhupada called the devotee over a little insect was crawling on the table. Prabhupada called the devotee over. He said, you see this insect? I said, oh Prabhupada, you want me to throw it out? Prabhupada said, I want you to think how to give him Krishna consciousness. We should think how to benefit all living entities, how to give God consciousness everywhere, to every form of life. And of course this was discussed by Haridas Thakur and Lord Chaitanya. Lord Chaitanya asked Haridas Thakur how to benefit all living entities and the answer was given by Haridas that the loud chanting of the holy names is beneficial to all living entities. Just chanting the holy name aloud will benefit all the living entities. One devotee opened a center I think, it, where was it? Somewhere in USA, another city, opened up a new center. And then he wrote to Prabhupada. He said, Prabhupada, he said, I don't think this center's successful. He said, nobody's coming. Prabhupada said, Prabhupada said nobody's coming. He said, just chant Hare Krishna. Is there so many living entities everywhere. Give them the holy name. So this was Prabhupada's mood. You know, he wanted Krishna consciousness to be distributed Everyone, every living entity, this is Krishna consciousness. The, to benefit all living entities, the loud chanting of the holy names is the, the best remedy, the best aid to all living entities to help them to get the higher consciousness, to make the best use of the body they have. So, chanting the holy name helps to awaken the soul within the living entities. Therefore, Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, Jeev Jago. The souls are sleeping, covered by maya, in ignorance about the goal of life. They just simply want to serve the tongue. The tongue wants to eat all different varieties of animal flesh and in order to do that they will kill so many different living entities. But they do not understand how the reactions will come from this and different reactions come upon the, the human being for his different sins. Uh, in in every society, they have the understanding of action and reaction. It's not there only within science, just like in the laws of motion. We learn that to every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So same way in Hindu society, in India, they have a saying, Jaisa karega, aisa barega. That you do like that, it will come back in the same way. In the Christian Bible, it says, As you sow, so shall you reap. You get the reactions for what you do. If you, in China also, we have a similar saying to this. They say, Zhong do de do, zhong gua de gua. That if you plant melons, you will harvest melons. And if you plant beans, you will harvest beans. Shan yo shan bao, er yo er bao. You see, even in Chinese they say, you do good, you will get good. You do bad, you will get bad. This is the laws of nature. It's there in every society. Whether there is God or not, whether you're atheist or not, 
this understanding is there all over the planet. But people are not understanding. They're thinking, oh, animal. Some people think animal has no soul. They think animal has no intelligence. Certainly animal has some intelligence. Just last night, I came out from the brahmachari kitchen and outside the brahmachari kitchen, three or four dogs are there. Why are they there? Because they know food is there. They're intelligent to understand where is the food and they know what time is the prasadam. They come exactly at the prasadam time because they're intelligent. They know. They want to eat. They'll get some food at that particular time. How can we say they have no intelligence? Even the plants show their intelligence. If you put the plant in the shady place, the plant will move towards the light because the plants need sunlight to grow. The plant will move in the direction of the sun to get the rays of the sun so it can grow. So everywhere there is intelligence in every form of life. And that intelligence is there. It's coming from the soul. Life. Consciousness. Certainly there is consciousness in the plants. There is consciousness in the animals. And just as there is consciousness in human beings. The, the point is our consciousness has become covered by ignorance. And that ignorance has to be removed. Therefore, Narada Muni is considering how to remove that ignorance. How to give them their, awaken their real consciousness. Hare Krishna. Any question? When we speak of nature, we should understand whose nature. Just like I have my nature and you have your nature, so similarly when we speak of nature, there's a personality behind this nature. And that personality is the Supreme Lord. There is the Prakriti, there is also Purush. Purusha means the enjoyer, the the, that person, that living force, the one who is prakriti, that energy, nature is prakriti, that prakriti is under the control of the purusha. And who is the purush? The original purusha is the Supreme Lord. Adi, Govindam Adi Pursham Tamaham Bajami. The Adi Purush, the, the original enjoyer this, of everything, is the Supreme Lord. So that nature is under him. His, it's his nature. Maya jakshena prakriti suyate sacharataram. Material nature moves under my direction, Lord Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita. The material nature is not independent. And similarly, Lord Brahma also describes in Brahma Samhita, Shristi stiti pralaya sadhana saktareka chayeva yasya bhuvanani vibhati durga. He's just, uh, Lord Brahma is describing the relationship between the material nature and the Supreme Lord. That the material nature moves like a shadow under the direction of the Supreme Lord. It's not independent. So behind the material nature is the proprietor, the controller of that nature. And that is the Supreme Lord.
generally that is correct that uh, first we have to ourselves become Krishna conscious then we can give Krishna consciousness to others uh, Bharata Bhumiti Haila Manusha Janma Sarta Janma Kare 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 Para Upakar uh, It is said that you're born in Bharat Vars, this planet is Bharat Vars, make your life successful. First make your life success, first become Krishna conscious yourself, make your life perfect yourself and then make others perfect. So it's not that we have to wait and sit back and wait till I become perfect before we try to help others. As much as we have realized, we have to share that with others. As much as we have understood, then we want to also give that to others. It is said, the more we distribute the mercy of Lord Chaitanya, the more we get the mercy ourselves. So you want to get the mercy, distribute the mercy. You give some mercy, give some little amounts of mercy, whatever little amount of mercy we're able to give, we give that to others. And by giving to others, then we get much more ourselves. So we shouldn't uh, just simply sit back and say, well, when I'm perfect, then I will go and preach. When I when I've realized everything, then I will go out and try to distribute. Whatever we know, we must try to share it now. We, we cannot just simply wait. We have to understand there's a great need for this knowledge. And it cannot wait until we're perfect. We cannot wait for things to just fall into place to happen. We have to do it now. We have to take advantage, whatever we have understood, whatever we have learned, then we want to share that. And by dis trying to distribute that, trying to give that to others, then we will get more realization ourselves. We will get more uh, understanding and more appreciation of this knowledge, the more we go out and try to distribute it to others. If we simply sit back, then we forget about what condition the world is in. We forget how much suffering is in the world. We can just simply live in our own corner and be comfortable and be happy. But we should also be compassionate on others and think how to help them, how to save them. So that is the business of a devotee. We don't want to just only deliver ourselves, we want to deliver everyone else. What should we do to stop the de Yes, well, we have to connect ourselves to Krishna's service. We have to utilize everything in the service of Krishna. We have to engage in activities of Krishna consciousness. Only the activities of Krishna consciousness can protect us from sense gratification. So if we're not, as you said, if we're not serving Krishna, then we're serving Maya, we're engaging in sense gratification. So how to counter sense gratification? We have to purify the sense gratification. We will get the greatest sense gratification by serving Krishna by using our senses in the service of Krishna. So we have to engage, we have to not only, in, we have to try to engage ourselves constantly in Krishna's service. 
We should be always on guard against maya. How to, be, how to protect herself from the material energy, from the illusion of trying to enjoy without Krishna. The only way we can protect ourselves is by having a good knowledge and then applying that knowledge by being active in Krishna's service. So we want to have that we want to be very cautious, to be always on guard. We had one devotee, I remember in London there was one devotee, he used to be a boxer before he became a devotee. So he was a boxer. So he told me, he said, he said, you know, when you fight, you have to keep your hands up. It's, if you drop your hands, then they'll punch you in the face and that's where you really get hurt, when they hit your face. So you, you got to keep your hands up, you keep your, your guard up. So Krishna consciousness is like that. We have to always be on guard, on guard against the illusion of the material energy. And, and in order to be on guard against the illusion of material energy, we have to always remember Krishna. And how to always remember Krishna? That is by chanting the holy name. If we keep the holy name on our tongue, keep chanting, and we have so many nice slokas, wonderful slokas from the scriptures to recite. We have so many wonderful uh, pastimes of the Lord to recount and to reflect on. We have to keep our minds always busy in this way. Don't allow the mind to contemplate the thought of sense gratification. When the mind wanders to sense gratification, bring it back. Just like the fly is always attracted to stool or some poison, some dirty th infected sore. The fly will find the sore. But we have to be like the bee. Go to the honey. Keep the mind always absorbed in thinking of Krishna, chanting the holy name, singing the different songs given to us by the Vaishnava Acharyas. Constantly, it's, it's, it takes some practice, but by practice we can become perfect. Hare Krishna. <laughs> well, our understanding should be based on what we have heard from authoritative sources, meaning sadhu, shastra and guru. So if you repeat what you have heard from sadhu, shastra and guru, that is perfect. If you say something which is not coming from sadhu, shastra and guru, then it's a problem. That is not perfect. So. Our business is to repeat what we have heard from the proper channels. Don't concoct. Don't invent something new. It must be authoritative. What we're speaking should be coming from the proper source. Meaning the sadhus, the holy men, the devotees, the, shas the scriptures and the spiritual teachers. We have to hear from these people and we repeat what we have learned from them. It's not that we have to learn something on our own without consulting these people. It has to come from the proper source. Just like in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna tells Arjuna, now hear from me, Arjuna. He doesn't say you go and find out yourself what is the truth. He said you hear from me. How by practicing yoga and full consciousness of me, you will know me in full, free from doubt. Now if you hear from other people, 
then there will be doubts. If you hear from unqualified, unauthorized sources, there will be doubts. But if you're hearing from sadhu, shastra and guru, there should be no doubt. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai. Srila Prabhupada ki. Gaur Premanandi.